Good morning. It's Friday, December 19th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 109. It's the last Tech Talk Today before the holiday break next week. All our regular shows will be in best ofs. And uh, so since the rest of the network is going to be on best ofs, or in some cases, like Women's Tech Radio and Beastie Now, they've recorded uh, all new shows. And even in the best of shows, we're going to have some new content in there. But because of that, I'm going to use the time to rip the studio apart and fix a few things that have been really bugging me. So this is the last episode before the holiday break. So why don't we start with our special holiday mumble crew. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Hello. 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 Hello, hello, hello. Hey, hey, we got some. Uh, hello. We, we got some of our regulars in here, and we also have a few visitors in, that are in here because it is the holiday season, and uh, they're not doing their regular thing. So let's dig into our first uh, story today, which uh, I was going to play with the format a little bit, but there turns out to be some pretty significant news breaking that I want to cover. So let's start with this first one that's probably going to have uh, a lot, a lot, a lot more reporting about it in the more technical aspects. But right now, this is coming from the Washington Post, reporting on some research that uh, discovered security flaws in something called SS7. Now, SS7 happens to be something that is fundamental to the way your cell phone works that you've never even heard of. Uh, More specifically, I believe uh, it's uh, how the cellular networks are able to communicate with each other across networks, um, perhaps even internationally. Uh, The flaws to be reported at a hacker conference this month are actually functions built into SS7 for other purposes, such as keeping calls connected when users speed down on highways, or when switching from cell tower to cell tower. So these are sort of standards across the industry that all cellular providers have to use, so that way cell phones are compatible when they move around like this. Uh, The hackers can repurpose these functions for surveillance because of lax security on the network. It is thought that these flaws were used for bugging German Chancellor Angela Merkel's phone, perhaps, by the NSA. So they they are, I think, implying that perhaps the bugging of some well-known officials by the NSA got people to try to figure out how are they doing this. Those skilled at housekeeping functions built into SS7 can locate callers anywhere in the world. Listen to calls as they happen. Record hundreds of encrypting calls and texts at the same time for later decryption offline. There is also potential to defraud users of cellular carriers by using SS7 functions, the researchers say. Hmm, maybe perhaps in the roaming areas. There's also, this is, this is another result of security being considered only after the fact, as opposed to being part of the initial design. Uh, and I have a link in the show notes for additional coverage. This is a pretty big story, so i just begun to sort of break it down. Uh, but... <laughs> The things that jump out at me about this is, specifically, they're trying to figure out, how did they get Angela Merkel's cell phone? So they begin going at it from this angle, right? And what they discover is using flaws in this SS7 uh, standard, is that they're even able to, they can locate, they can be in Washington State and locate someone in Germany. That's... That's mind blowing, right? Is, is, Is that blow anybody else's mind? I mean, that's just, that's incredible. Anywhere in the world? I mean, the cellular network has really become a global locating system, I guess. Um, So uh, it's this SS7 system that's flawed. Much more open than we're used to, but I guess that's how the the phone systems are. Like the, I'm trying to think, is it System 7? What's the the protocol that the original phone systems ran on? I mean, they're actually... Captain Crunch and all that. They're actually... You know, uh, they're actually, the thing is, they're talking about the Global Signal System 7 network. So is that what you're talking about? I think so. Yeah, Uh, it is very old. Uh, It's an outdated infrastructure that's very easy to hack. Uh, So these German researchers discovered the flaw. It was built in SS7 for other purposes. So they're just using functionalities that's actually built into it. Carriers like AT&T, Verizon... Uh, with 3G and 4G networks for calls, and texts are sent from people within the same network. But they use, even if you have the, the latest generation uh, wireless technology, in secure SS7 when they send data across between networks. So at this point where the networks have to meet, that's where this comes into play. And since all the networks have to be able to talk to each other, they all have this. <laughs> Old technology has been in use for a long time. I'd say that might just seem not great. Uh, so uh, what do you do to get avoid being hacked or spied on by people exploiting SS7? Uh, the ACLU's principal technologist, Christopher Slogan, said, don't use the telephone service provided by the phone company for voice. <laughs> their voice yep, channel, much does it. Their voice <laughs> channel is not cool. secure, period. 
There you go. Wow. Wow. Uh, so this is a story that will continue to develop uh, while we're on holiday break, and if there's any major developments, I'll follow up on it when we get back, and we'll probably also roll coverage into TechSnap. Uh, additional links in the show notes if you want to read more about it. It's pretty crazy. All right, we got one more security thing, and then I got a story that's going to make everybody feel really good. So don't worry. It's not all bad stuff right before the holidays. But this one's important, especially as we just started OpenYourMouth.Recipes for open source recipes from the Jupiter Broadcasting Community, which is going amazing. It's going freaking amazing. Open your mouth. Recipes. Go check it out. It's it's a really really cool way to collaborate with the Jupiter Broadcasting community on shared recipes of food. It's in Markdown. It's really easy to use. Uh, so speaking of Git, <laughs> go update your clients, everybody. Uh, GitHub has announced a security vulnerability and has encouraged users to update their Git clients as soon as possible. The blog post reads in part, A critical Git security vulnerability has been announced today, affecting all versions of the official Git client and related software that interacts with Git repositories, including GitHub for Windows and GitHub for Mac. Because of this, a client-side only vulnerability, GitHub.com and GitHub Enterprise, are not directly affected, so it's client-side stuff. Uh, the vulnerability comes as Git and Git-compatible clients access Git repositories in case-insensitive or case-normalizing file systems. Oh. <laughs> An attacker can craft a malicious <laughs> Git tree that will cause Git to overwrite its own Git config file while cloning or checking out a repository. Git clients running on OS X, HFS+, Plus, or any versions of Windows are exploitable through this vulnerability. Linux clients are not affected if they run a case-sensitive file system. Interesting. And exploit because of case insensitivity. So uh, if you are on one of those uh, uh, really adorable operating systems, uh, go update uh, your, your Git client. All right, now here's some good news. Here's some good news. Uh, this, is a, this is amazing. This reminds you that we really are almost in 2015 now. A double amputee is controlling two robotic robotic robotic. Robot arms. He's controlling his robot arms with his mind. Uh, kind of like, yeah, he's actually, uh, he's just thinking the commands and the arms uh, do as he says. The project's researchers have been developing these modular prosthetic limbs over a decade. Uh, this, though, is the first bilateral shoulder-level amputee. He lost them in, a, in like an electrical accident, His both his arms. Uh, so he is able to control these through his mind, but they had to actually rework some of his nerves. Uh, it's a procedure called targeted muscle reinvenation. I think I'm or renerveration or something like that. It's really crazy. Uh, it's re it, where they reassign the nerves that once controlled his arms and hands. Once that was done, the team recorded the patterns that his brain makes for each muscle he moves, and then they had him control virtual arms to prepare for the real thing. So they simulated the arms in the computer. Uh, pretty neat. He's been, by the way, if I uh, read correctly and noted it down correctly, uh, he hasn't had his arms for almost 40 years. So uh, they give him these ro these robot arms, and I'll jump ahead a little bit so you can see what it looks like. But this is him controlling them right here, uh, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. ...ahead of us, and, and we just started down this road, and I think the next five, ten years are going to bring some really phenomenal advancements. Other milestones reached by the team were, this was the first time the MPLs were operated by a shoulder level amputee at the full three degrees of freedom and with over 30 total degrees of motion on both sides with complete intuitive thought-based control. He has access to all of the different degrees of motion, shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, but he still needs to select which one he wants to use. So he needs to position the shoulder, then the elbow, then the wrist, then the hand separately and rest in between. Maybe I'll be able to, for once, be able to put change in a pop machine and get the pop out of it. Simple things like that that most people never think of. And, it, and it's reavailable to me. Pretty crazy. Um, and uh, I think the funding for this research actually has a military connection, so it's possible that there's, there's other uses for this technology. I would think. I love that though. That is that is so cool. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, it's it's obviously you know they have to they had to map these nerves and then had to you know watch them in the computer to see when he thought about doing something what nerves were lit up and then they had to map that specifically to, all to him. So uh, I think this is probably uh, something they couldn't just mass produce. They have to you know custom build it for each person. 
But you kind of figure that this is a, an amazing first start. They may be I'll able to say. do some kind of a matrix thing that just scans the nerve, you know, like a blanket mesh of sensors, scans the nerve pulses, and then maps it to the different motors eventually. Yeah. Uh, anyways, it's... Uh... It's kind of exciting, and I when I think of this kind of stuff, we, we got this we're working on, we're working on VR. There's some really amazing stuff that's around the corner that's going to make our smartphones seem really quaint. Speaking of smartphones, the first Ubuntu smartphone will launch in Europe in February. Yeah, uh, by uh, BQ, remember them. Uh, BQ's been around for a little while. We've talked about them a lot on some of our other shows, and uh, here's what we know so far. Uh, unlike the version you've been getting now, if you've been playing with it, which is probably for a Nexus 4 if you're doing it right. Uh, this is going to be a dedicated device, the Aquarius E 4.5 handset preloaded with Ubuntu. It's going to have a 4.5-inch screen with a 540 by 960 resolution, 1.3 gigahertz quad-core ARM Cortex-A7 MediaTek processor, uh, a Mali 400 GPU at 500 megahertz, and 8 gigabytes of storage, 1 gigabyte of RAM. A couple other things. Unlike the, the regular version you've been getting, there's going to be some additional software, including an aggregator scope for uh, paid content, which I'm not familiar with that. Uh, and then there's also rumors about future BQ models. So February uh, in Europe, don't know on the price. Let's say it's uh, in $350 range. Anybody be tempted to pick it up? Really? Nobody? I'm tempted to pick it up, and it's not even available in the U.S., really. It, it's just so traumatic to try and learn a new phone. I, I know it's embarrassing to say, but it just... I appreciate I the honesty there. The loss of my... <clears throat> no, man. I, I, uh, I'm I, the guy that pushed out the reload of my Bonobo for months and months and months and months because I just really liked my setup. Everything was working really well, and I didn't really feel like going through all of that. If, uh, if it's cheap enough... I might consider getting one as a backup phone. Hmm. I think I would. I think my inclination would be. My inclination would be to wait for potentially the higher end model that would maybe we would see like the Aquarius Five later in the year, and uh, just keep it working on my Nexus Five because the Nexus Five is a much better phone than this BQ uh, uh, Aquarius E Four Point Five. So. Um, I I am I I want a good phone. I guess that's my point. Uh, when I buy a phone, I want the one that is really well built and uh, is a good experience and has a great screen and has pretty modern technology. And uh, that's where this one doesn't really appeal to me. But the, you know, I don't think we're the target audience, so that's fine. Well, I mean, from my perspective of wanting a cheaply priced backup phone, that's exactly what I'd want. Yeah, there you go. But. For my main device, I'd love to see Ubuntu for the phone be ported over to the Moto X. Now, uh, a lot of us, yeah, no kidding, a lot of us were expecting this to ship in 2014, including a frequent uh, guest on the show, uh, Popey. He said that, uh, he said, in fact, that if there wasn't a Ubuntu phone by the end of 2014, he'd wear his underwear on his head. So I think uh, the uh, that's official. The underwear bet has... Just been called, and your payment is due, Mr. Popey. Your payment is due. Put it in the red book. I'm going to uh, go ahead and give that a uh, plus one. I'm going to give that a plus one. But it is exciting for them nonetheless, and I think this is an important, important, important first step for the Ubuntu phone project. You know, my my long-term hope for Ubuntu phone is that it sort of gives us what we have today with PCs. As phone hardware maybe potentially normalizes a little bit, uh, maybe. Maybe we could have, like today, where I could get a PC. I could, I could today, I could drive over to the Costco, buy the studio. I could walk in there. I could probably grab whatever crap hardware they have, and I could probably bring it back to the studio, and I could probably load Linux on it. But, like, I could not make that same bet with a phone today. Uh, and I think, if anything, if the Ubuntu phone project can change that a little bit so that phones are more a little bit like, computers where I can load my own operating system and and if Ubuntu gets that right and that gets popular I think you'll see a lot of other distros sort of imp improving upon they'll they'll come at it like it's their idea but they'll improve upon the design and it'll become like how we can get distributions installed on PCs today maybe we can get distributions installed on phones one day for us enthusiasts and for the other folks that can buy the hardware like this that's more in their budget range and stuff so we'll see that's that's what I look forward to 
Uh, all right, one last little uh, bit of feedback before we wrap up before the holiday break. Uh, oh, I also forgot to mention that uh, that Ubuntu phone does have dual micro SIMs, which is kind of cool. Uh, all right, so uh, this was submitted by uh, Callisti5 in the uh, subreddit over at techtalktoday.reddit.com, and he was following up on that last Friday. We we had a uh, we had a special where we looked back at a piece of hardware that would use TV signals to download. Uh, content at quote unquote broadband speeds. Back when modems were 288, right? This thing was actually able to download like a four megabyte file in a few seconds. It was a really, it was the idea is we could utilize the analog TV airwaves to transmit high speed internet. In fact, it's still something a lot of people are working on. So I, I showcased a device that we'd never really seen make it to market. And I didn't even know the name of it. Well, uh, Callie here sent it in. He says, uh, the TV card for downloading stuff was called the WaveTop. It was made by a company called WavePhone. I remember it being really cool. As soon as I found out, they started sending out messages about the service being discontinued, though. It was a little after he bought it. Uh, the only channel that I had data on it was my local PBS channel. I, w- I did keep the original CD. I can't find anything online about it. I know, same. Uh, but archive.org. Oh, archive.org has their website. Uh, it took quite a long time to get the data downloaded, and it really needed a good TV signal to work on the old rabbit ears. Man, I feel old remembering stuff like that. Uh, so uh, here's the Wavetop page from archive.org uh, from July 10th, 1998. So cool. Thank you for sending that in. That is a that that really completed that uh, little bit of mystery there. And, uh, maybe one day, well, because you think about it, TV signals like you could have a receiver in your smartphone. That might be another alternative way to get data on on tablets and things like that. So I'm always really fascinated about it. Hey, as we go into the holiday, we'd appreciate your support. Patreon.com slash today. I'm going to be doing a bunch of work in studio, doing upgrades, making changes, fixing things. Um, and a lot of it is thanks to the budget pre- predictability you guys have given us and the runway to improve upon things. Patreon.com slash today is where you can go to invest in any of the Jupiter Broadcasting content. If there's a couple of shows you like, a few shows you've gotten value from, go over there. Plus, as I go, I'll be posting a couple of the videos on some of the things I'm doing and giving you guys updates behind the scenes, and those will be exclusive to our patrons over at patreon.com slash today. Over there right now is the Dev Summit video and some recent behind-the-scenes tours, so you can check those out. Also check out uh, jbdev.community for that as well. Patreon.com slash today. Thanks to all 431 of you. And a happy holidays, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Hope you will have a great holiday week. We'll have some good shows for you throughout the week, so keep checking back on the site. And if you can still submit stories to the subreddit and vote, too. Maybe we'll, maybe I when, uh, when we come back after the holiday break, I'll go there and see which ones were the highest uh, voted up that we missed, and we can cover. We'll do like a roundup of those. And Mumble Room, don't forget where your microphones are at. Oh, well, hi there, Angela. Oh, hi. Did you have anything you wanted to add before I run? I only caught the Patreon ad. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> it's not an ad. It's just a thank you. <clears throat> or a thank you, whatever. I didn't catch any of the show. <laughs> uh, well, it's nice to see you before I run for the holiday break. We had a good show today. Good. Yeah, there's some some good news, some bad news, but all in all, you missed the, probably the really cool story you should check in the show notes after we're done is the W amputee. The double amputee who controls his arms, his robotic, his oh, robot I, arms with his I mind. I saw that. You're so internet hip. I know. (laughs) All right. Well, that'll wrap up uh, this episode of Tech Talk today. Uh, We'll be back after the holiday break. And uh, I decided this isn't really a tech commercial, but it's one of the commercials from my childhood that really, when this came on TV, and man, did they run it for a long time, but this always meant it really, truly was time for Christmas. It's a little sappy, but I love it. Thanks for joining us. Have a happy holidays, and see you after the break, everybody. Breakfast. Oh, oh, oh.